Hola, buenas tardes. Uh, I want uh, to thanks first all the argument team, Blanca, Tony, uh, David, Marcelo, for bringing another uh, wonderful lecture to our school. James Binning, thank you, James, for being with us today. Belonging to Assemble Studio, and Assemble Studio is for me a very interesting experience because it's a team, it's a big team. I told him that I was expecting the 18 that they are giving, giving a lecture together. They sent us only one, but he draws very well. <laughs> we have a drawing of him in our signatures book of the school. Now, thank you for playing that role too and following my, my joke. Uh, all, the, all the architects that come to the school have to draw and have to draw something in our book. So I will pass uh, to you the uh, presentation of his work. They are very, very special. They have won the Turner Award, meaning that it's the first guys dealing uh, with architecture, dealing with space, dealing with other kind of arts that have won that very prestigious award. And uh, I am very interested in people who have mixed fields who are working in a lot of things at the same time in a lot of different professions, blends to do that. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being at Exxon. And the floor is yours. Thank you, Manuel. Bueno, eh, vamos a hacer una presentación muy breve, eh, primero en castellano, luego en inglés, eh, también para que sepáis un poco cuál es la idea del ciclo. Esta es la segunda conferencia, la primera la tuvimos hace eh, unas semanas con el estudio Moto, que igual probablemente alguno de vosotros asistiríais. Y bueno, lo que os queríamos comentar es que para nosotros era importante, cuando empezamos a preparar esta, este ciclo, pensar que, como el propio nombre de, de la idea tiene, eh, queríamos buscar un argumento, una especie como de idea que aglutinara eh, lo que queríamos poner sobre la mesa. ¿no? Tenía bastante que ver con este título que decidimos, Making Matters, y que mmm, pensábamos que tenía un, un doble significado, un significado dual, que nos parecía que estaba presente en nuestra manera de pensar los proyectos y queríamos eh, ponerlo de alguna manera de manifiesto para que pudiera generar una especie de hilo conductor. ¿no? Por una parte está... Algo que nos parecía sustancial, que es la importancia de producir, de manipular, de trabajar con elementos físicos. Y por otra, la idea de la materia y la propia concepción, de la, concepción material de la arquitectura. Con esta idea, con este contexto en el que la producción y la investigación material era como un punto absolutamente central del ciclo, eh, hemos preparado esta... Estos seis invitados, que es Estudio Moto, como os he comentado, que sabéis que vino hace unas semanas. Hoy tenemos a James Vinny en The Assemble. Vendrá eh, el estudio de Dan Holtrop. Y en el segundo cuatrimestre tendremos a Teda, Tak y Bernardo Bader. Son diferentes estudios en los que pretendemos que también ofrezcan, aparte de contar sus proyectos y el interés que tiene lo que están generando actualmente, también ofrezcan como enfoques diferentes, pero también complementarios sobre esta cuestión de, de la producción y la investigación material, ¿no? Enfoques que pueden ir como eh, la idea de trabajar y ensamblar elementos industrializados con el objeto de conseguir esta abstracción que nos contaba Moto. Eh, la propia experimentación material, que es el germen de muchos de los proyectos que está generando Ann Holtrop. O una redefinición, una relectura también de las técnicas tradicionales y la producción local, en el caso de, de TEDA o en el caso que tenemos hoy de James Binning y, y su colectivo Assemble, esta confianza en, la, en, en lo colectivo y en la redefinición como de los límites de la arquitectura desde la idea de la, de la, pro, de la propia producción. ¿no? Hemos querido también hacer algo que nos parecía que era muy importante, que era intentar superar de alguna manera los límites de una conferencia eh, convencional. Para eso nos parecía que era apropiado, eh, siguiendo con la idea de Making Matters, de, de, esta, de poner en valor lo material, eh, pensar en que podíamos eh, pedir a cada uno de los invitados eh, que trajera a sus conferencias una muestra o un ejemplo material que haya sido relevante por algún motivo en alguno de sus proyectos. Entonces, para eso hemos mandado a cada uno de estos seis estudios una maleta como esta, y que, bueno, les hemos pedido que la llenaran, que, la, que pudieran introducir los elementos que ellos consideraran eh, más relevantes 
la trajeran aquí y nos lo pudieran mostrar de alguna manera, eh, que lo pudiéramos ver de cerca, ¿no? Eh, con el objeto de superar esta distancia ¿no? que ofrecen las, eh, las imágenes que hay tanto en las conferencias como en las propias publicaciones. ¿no? Poner de manifiesto estas estrategias materiales que en el fondo eh, nos interesa conocer de primera mano. ¿no? Bueno, eh, voy a dar el paso a Marcelo, eh, que va a presentar a James Binning y espero que disfrutéis de la conferencia y que luego, por supuesto, hagáis todas las preguntas que os apetezca y a ver si podemos disponer de un rato de conversación. Well, just a few more words for a short introduction of our guest, James Binning, and his collective, Assemble. Well, Assemble is a multidisciplinary collective uh, working across the fields of architecture, design, and art to understand and to improve uh, the cultural use and the physical form of the city and landscape. Uh, founded in 2010 to undertake a single self-built project, Assemble has since delivered a diverse and award-winning body of work uh, while retaining a cooperative and democratic uh, working method. As they explain, their work is about making things as well as making things happen. Maybe today we could add that their work is also about ma making things matter as well. Uh, well, James uh, is uh, part of this uh, award-winning design collective. Uh, he, is, uh, he was part of the, of the large founding group. Um, since then, he has worked on a large number of uh, public institutional furniture installation projects at a wide range of, of scales. And he also combines his uh, professional activity with uh, teaching activity at the CAS School of Art and Design in, in London. So please, let's welcome James Binning. Um, yeah, hi, so um, I've brought a few things in a suitcase with me today, which I'll try not to break, it's okay at the moment. Uh, which would hopefully be a very useful prop. Um, and this is an amazing presentation of it. Um, I'm going to give quite a general talk, I think, in the course of the presentation about um, some of our projects which are a bit less high, um, and some are quite small in scale. But I think they reflect um, the kind of diversity of maybe the ways that we're trying to work across um, quite a range of, of kind of scales and forms of um, kind of organisation within within our practice. <coughs> um, so this is us. This is a slightly embarrassing picture now that we took a few years ago when it seemed like a good idea to climb over buildings and things. Um, but this was uh, most of the people in the assembles. It's quite a mixed group of people. Um, we actually got quite a few phone calls from the health and safety people in the UK who were very sharp these things because it is quite dangerous. Um, so there are there are 18 of us at the moment in the practice um, and we all kind of studied together um, in 2010 or we graduated in 2009 um, and so we studied for the sort of three years before that um, at university and then after that really in 2009 when we graduated it was a very difficult moment in time um, because of the financial circumstances were very different, I guess, to the decade that had led up to that point. Um, and so while we, you know, many of us were able to kind of get jobs in, in architecture practices, the kinds of jobs that those architects were working on were very different to the things that they'd uh, been able to kind of build and make their name. Um, and I think at that moment it felt like there was a huge disconnect between the way that we were taught to understand architecture as a kind of public practice um, and a kind of uh, a profession which was in some senses a, a form of public service, even if it was a private profession for the most part. Um, that really felt very difficult to kind of align with the reality of the kinds of work that most practices were engaged with. Um, and so this idea that, you know, we were taught to believe in <coughs> students that as architects we were kind of learning tools that would enable us to kind of shape the world around us and, and, and do, you know, <laughs> uh, in, in broad terms, kind of good things uh, and quite concrete things, that really felt like a, a very 
uh, a kind of promise which wasn't really substantiated or, or very easy to believe in um, based <coughs> on the kinds of things that we were able to do in practice at that time. Um, now our kind of work is quite broad and that's come about really through trying to build a practice which is based not only on doing commissioned work in um, which can often feel a bit precarious maybe um, but to try to be a bit more diverse and also try to work and communicate about architecture to a slightly more diverse audience than um, maybe the profession is um, kind of often able to do through building. Um, sometimes that's through research and exhibition so this is a project we did um, which kind of looked at the legacy of uh, brutalist um, design and modernist uh, kind of housing projects in London, um, which were primarily built by the public sector, so by the kind of um, town council and the mayor um, between the kind of mid 50s and, and mid 70s. Um, sometimes these incredibly kind of bold, ambitious, and um, sort of sculptural structures, um, which often were demolished because they were seen as too kind of dangerous or, or kind of risky for kids to play on. And instead, they're replaced by swings and slides and all of these quite boring um, kind of figures that you can only really use in the way that they allow through their design. Um, and so sort of revisiting some of the, the ideas and the sort of risk that was inherent in these structures and the ambition. Um, and the idea, I guess, of like childhood and education in a sense that they embodied, remaking them in a, a kind of soft foam um, so rather than having a kind of passive exhibition in a gallery context, it was something which could be experienced in a way. Um, these ideas could be kind of revisited in a much more active way. Um, early in our sort of time together, we also built quite a large number of temporary projects, um, often because that was all we were able to do. It was all of the kind of the budgets that we were working with would allow, um, and the kind of clients that we were working with were able to sort of um, think about or have ambitions for. Um, but I think often temporary projects were, were quite an extraordinary way of, of, kind of taking risks and proposing um, quite ambitious uses or trying to think very imaginatively about what broader architectural opportunities might exist in a space which would never really be possible um, if you're doing kind of longer, more um, longer term, kind of more concrete projects, maybe for public organisations where those risks are often um, the, or the management of those risks is a much more kind of critical factor in how decisions get made and the types of things which are built. Um, and we also do relatively conventional uh, architecture projects in a sense. This was the largest project we, we won to date through a competition. It was for a three and a half million pound building, so back then probably about four million euros um, for the reuse of uh, some Victorian um, kind of bathhouse infrastructure, so public bath. Um, kind of boiler rooms and things like that. Um, so relatively traditional in the sense that it was a competition, we won it as the architect and um, spent the last few years designing it. Um, but we've always been very interested in materials, I think partly because when we were working with very low budgets it felt important to try to make something which was materially rich and unusual and sort of took um, and built on the resourcefulness maybe that we had in practice. Um, where we've been encouraged not always to make kind of models in grey cards and sort of abstractions of reality, but to test things at one to one and to get hold of things which maybe seemingly had very little value um, or which we were able to afford as students or when we were doing our first projects because we had very little resources to, to acquire higher value materials. It was mostly about trying then to, to use our skill and our understanding of how to make things to, to bring a different value um, to materials that may be part of their kind of everyday experience of of the city, um, and often also an interest in spaces that were perceived to have very little value for other people. Um, so the first project we showed, which I'll talk about in a minute, was in a, in a cinema in a petrol station um, that was empty and waiting for redevelopment. This project was underneath um, a kind of motorway flyover. So spaces which are sort of um, outside of regular economic ownership, you know, and don't you know? Nobody can build on this site and turn it into flats. You know, it has no developable value um, according to the kind of more commercial logic of the city. So, actually, often those spaces we think are quite interesting opportunities um, to kind of test more unusual and ambitious um, and kind of strange and unexpected uses. Um, thinking about how these often like forgotten bits of the city could be 
actually quite a valuable um, form of public space at a time <coughs> where lots of other kinds of public space, the shopping streets, the recreation environments are more and more regulated. Um, and also sometimes thinking about um, like processes. I guess this was a project that we did in, in a place called Croydon in South London uh, in, a, in a very, very depressed uh, kind of failed new town. So after the Second World War, um, lots of towns were built around London that weren't very well connected to the centre. Um, this was one of them. Uh, and consequently, since it had been built, it had always experienced uh, unusually high levels of unemployment and all of those things. Um, and whilst obviously a, a public space project isn't going to solve all those things, it can't alleviate or, or address kind of a huge spectrum of social problems. The physical environment in this town was, was itself a kind of symbol or a kind of signal of the level of expectation and, and, and sort of civic ambition that the town um, could be seen to have. Like, so this space, which is, we've redesigned as a kind of new civic centre, was just a car park. Um, but in order to kind of move beyond the conversation about uh, you know, what, what may or may not be possible in this space, um, we designed uh, a new kind of arrangement for the town square and then built the town square um, entirely out of temporary staging uh, for two months. We used 10% of the project budget to do that, so quite a substantial amount of the project budget. Um, but that became a way of holding a conversation with, um, I guess, the public or that use this space regularly um, without having to use the usual tools that architects use to talk about space and projects. So instead of drawings um, and sort of speculating on what would and wouldn't work and really getting into quite a, an argumentative situation often with people who felt like the money would be better invested in security to stop crime happening in the area and all of these things. We built the town square at reasonable cost, um, but then were able to bring out lots of activities that were happening around the town and understand how in the summer months and at specific times of year, the town could be a civic space that was well used. It could be more than just a, a kind of space where people park their cars or, or were scared to walk through in the evenings. Um, so there's quite an interest, I think, in, in both materials, um, in kind of the wider processes that we use to make projects and make arguments for, for design <coughs> beyond maybe the typical ones that architects use to, to make drawing models. Um, and I think also in, in thinking a bit more um, expansively about how we can take advantage of opportunities that exist in the city that maybe other more regular um, you know, developers or town councils wouldn't see as opportunities that our education kind of equips us to sort of identify and maybe act on. Um, so I'm going to talk about two small projects initially, um, which were in very different contexts. One was in North London, uh, very close to where Tottenham Hotspur play their football. Um, and another was in Japan, in a very rural context. Um, but both of them were, were projects which we finished relatively recently, where we had a very uh, strong hand in the process by which those buildings were, were kind of physically made as well as designed. Um, so this was a very unpromising site, a kind of little kiosk that had been closed for about 20 years, um, very small wedge-shaped building uh, right outside the tube station. And the brief for this project was to, to spend a relatively small amount of money on refurbishing this space, um, which uh, at first, it didn't seem like a particularly exciting uh, herb brief. It's, it's quite small and, and, and quite underwhelming, like almost invisible, really, when people kind of walk past it. Um, but we were very interested in uh, the kind of legacy of the underground stations that were designed by um, successive generations of architects, really. These ones were built typically between 1910 and 1925. Um, and they're all kind of clad in these um, very rich, uh, glazed ceramic <coughs> tiles. They give these buildings, which really were the time pieces of, you know, one of the first pieces of public infrastructure, um, a real civic presence. Um, you know, they're very identifiable um, and really sort of celebrate actually a very simple function that happens within to move people around the city. 
Um, and we started the process, I mean, often we want um, kind of models at this stage because we find it to be much quicker um, and much more intuitive, certainly when you're working at this scale, than, um, than going straight into computer drawings. So actually in this project we produced very, very few computer drawings, and actually when we did go to the computer it was only um, to actually design a series of moulds um, and forms which were quite complex. We did very little design work in the computer for a project of this scale. So it was really testing how quite a simple set of additions or changes to the fabric of the building um, could give it more presence on the corner of the street and a different sort of civic presence. Um, and in the, the end, we, we sort of narrowed it down to this one. So adding something which was a bit more like a, a kind of clock tower that made it a monument on the corner outside the station um, and added a kind of public benches on each corner which framed um, the kind of kiosk part where somebody would serve um, out of a shop. And we were quite interested in this language of uh, clay, clay tiles that had been kind of developed 100 years earlier for the first generation of, of kind of public infrastructure um, and stations. And we started working with a, a ceramic artist uh, called Matthew Raw to develop a series of, of clay bodies. Um, and so rather than trying to <coughs> colour the, the glaze itself, uh, or, or make the tile that you then glaze and fire, um, to colour the body of the clay itself through using different kind of pigments that you then mix in. Um, so it's a much kind of earlier stage in the process, you're, you're determining the shape and character of the tile. Um, but it was necessary to do that from a, a kind of quite pragmatic perspective as well, um, because it meant that we would only have to fire each of the tiles uh, kind of once rather than twice, so self-glazing. Um, rather than two stages, whereas if you, if you kind of bisque fired it and then you glaze it, it's two, and that adds time and cost and, and additional energy in the firings and things. Um, so in this respect, it was quite pragmatic, but also an unusual and different process from the ones which had kind of originally been used. Um, and, and this kind of scale of production, there were around four and a half thousand tiles. Um, so it felt like something which was probably possible for us to take control over. And I think often at this sort of scale, um, there's an economy which is possible, which, uh, which means that it, it sort of just about makes sense for us to produce these things and do that work and, and, and build this project profitably. But if we were to, to sort of develop the samples and things, here's an example of it. Um, here, so relatively small format tile, um, quite evidently handmade. If you come up at the end, you can sort of see that there's it's kind of ripples in the edge of the profile. They're not exactly kind of uniform or mechanically made. Um, but to, to get a company to do that would be very high cost because it would involve them setting up a process which is very different <coughs> from the way that they ordinarily manufacture much larger volumes. Um, and also something which is quite difficult to instruct. You know, it's quite intuitive really when you're working with this kind of process and you want to create a lot of variety in each individual tile. That's something which is quite difficult to communicate in a written instruction or in a drawing to a contractor, potentially. Um, so actually it just enables us to work much more loosely and experimentally um, in a process, but still um, achieve a certain kind of scale or quality. Um, and we started the project by just producing an enormous um, kind of range of, of different tiles and, and experiments with adding different amounts of pigment, mixing the clay through in different ways. So some of them were mechanically mixed, um, which give you a much more kind of marbly texture. Um, some of them where you roll out the tile and then you put little splodges in and roll it over so they're more spotty. So there's immense like, variety and not a, a huge um, kind of preciousness or care about um, achieving a particular outcome or finish. So in lots of projects, there's just a big bit at the beginning, I think, where we try to work in a way which is very open-ended and exploratory, um, and then sit back and reflect on um, what the opportunities might be. So really it's between working at, at, through those models which have an idea about the kind of formal quality we're looking for and then working quite extensively through the use of materials to kind of refine a bit more um, the kind of detailed character of it. Um, we might then often go back and produce drawings but actually often um, this is a much more critical stage in the development of the character of the project. Um, and obviously on a, a building like that, there's some more kind of complex elements. Not all of the tiles are two-dimensional. Um, 
And so often, actually, one of the more technically difficult parts is just working out how to fabricate it. Um, we're not professional fabricators. I think even in this project, we usually work with a collaborator who knows a bit more about it than we do. But find that actually that there's also a, a kind of usefulness to the naivety that we bring to things. We don't necessarily approach things in the right way to do it technically. Um, and often that can lead to uh, some wasted time or misdirected energy, but it often also leads to quite unusual results. So I think we're interested in sort of that, that dialogue between expertise and, and kind of really deep technical skill um, and also being able to work in a more kind of free and, and slightly childish way often. Um, but so the three dimensional elements were formed by CNC milling um, in hard foam with the positive shape of the tile. So we built a rhino model of the, 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 the more complex parts, made those using a CNC milling machine, and then cast those shapes to get the plaster negatives. Um, and then we use them to roll out these simple clay forms, some of which are two-dimensional, some of which are three-dimensional. Um, and then as the clay sits on the plaster mould, the wet plaster, or the dry plaster will absorb the water out, and then the, this shape, even though it's quite thin and fragile, will just pop out very simply. Um, and then they were assembled on site by the, by the contractor. Um, and so we'd... Oh, show you a punchline. Um, and so often we'll kind of mock up in the studio um, the kind of more complex elements and junctions so that we, if we need to refine them uh, in the process before we make 4,000, we'll make 40 or whatever to try and test some of the things that we'll, um, we'll kind of encounter as technical issues. Um, you know, and then you use sort of mock-ups of this sort of scale to develop some of the things in terms of the coloration and what the approach is precisely. Um, and then... Um, uh, and then this is the final building. So it's, it's, it's not the most tasteful thing. Uh, <laughs> it's pretty weird. Um, but, but I think, um, and there was, you know, this is probably one of the more contentious ones in studio discussions where, you know, nobody is really in charge of saying, like, we should use that colour or this colour. There's no director. And there's still a bit of a conversation today whenever we look at an image of this about whether the colours were really the right colours. Um, <laughs> But I, I think it, it is quite successful. It's highly unusual um, in the, the kind of material, um, the kind of material richness and variety. Um, and I think the uh, the brief, which was really to to kind of renovate the kiosk in such a way that it became a local landmark and somewhere that people would meet, um, and was distinctive enough to support a business uh, within this unit when many other businesses had previously occupied it and failed. It's been quite successful in that regard. Um, so I, don't I wouldn't advocate for this as a, a whole new form of aesthetics, which I think is going to define the next decade. Um, but I, I think in, in terms of uh, maybe the process and, and thinking about how you manufacture something at that scale, it was quite a useful and interesting project for us to, to kind of work through. Also with a public client, so there are very stringent kind of standards and requirements that that project needs to meet. Um, a bit different to some of the other ones we'll talk about later. Um, the second project I'm going to talk about briefly is uh, a project we finished um, a couple of years ago in Japan. Um, very, very different context in a sort of post-industrial situation. This is an old sawmill um, in a town which has uh, adopted a zero waste kind of policy. So it was the first town in Japan um, to sort of legally make itself zero waste as it's part of its kind of political agenda for a new mayor coming in. Um, and within that context, uh, lots of other businesses have started to move into the area and kind of bring new kind of industrial uses uh, and jobs into the, to the region where maybe it's just been in a sort of slow decline for the past 20 years. Mm. And one of those was a, a brewery um, who sort of bought all of these buildings and were interested in working with us to build one sort of very small building um, which would be visible as you kind of came up uh, the valley. Um, and that sort of signaled a slightly different use um, within the, the context of the rest of the site, which would remain more or less um, kind of as found in terms of the buildings. Um, so we built this thing, which is uh, sort of part way between a very small um, medieval English pub 
and um, uh, a very humble and rustic Japanese tea room. Um, but re a really critical part of this project, I think, for the client um, was us understanding the, the kind of skills and traditions which existed within the, the kind of local area. Um, and thinking quite carefully about how we could um, sort of support or draw upon the knowledge and wisdom that exists in places like this in Japan, um, which is increasingly uh, kind of not passed on to the next generation. Um, and so we worked really with three um, local kind of craftspeople who were in their 70s, all of them, and who spent really like a lifetime perfecting particular techniques. Um, uh, and we also chose to use kind of local timber, um, predominantly like Japanese cedar. You can get these um, incredibly straight timbers in up to 12 meters in length. Um, and so we were able to make a very kind of simple um, kind of cone structure using timber that was chopped down very close to the site, seasoned quite quickly, um, and then yeah, arranged in this this kind of spiraling structure, which accentuated the kind of the internal the internal space. Um, and so the program for this is very simple. It's just a space for, for basically workers to occasionally sit and have a drink and look down the valley um, or to take kind of guests and visitors to, to sort of sample some of the beers that are being produced um, on the brewery site. Um, and we chose to use uh, like indigo growing. It's quite um, a big industry on the island of Shikoku in the south of the main island with, which Tokyo is on. Um, and that's become increasingly popular in recent years, mainly in, in the kind of clothing industry, a sort of textile dyeing. Um, but historically, there's also a bit of a tradition in terms of using it as a, as a kind of paint or a building stain. Um, and so we worked with one of the workshops that was there, um, the ferment and process indigo, um, to produce a, a treatment, basically, for the exterior of this building. Um, and we, we took all of the timber boards before they were... Um, put onto the building um, and stained a third of them once, a third of them twice, and the final third three or four times. So that each of the boards um, has, as you can see, has a slightly different, um, you get some darker ones, some slightly paler ones. Um, and again, not to any particular like precise design. Um, you know, there wasn't an elevation or a series of drawings which showed where each of these panels would go. I think it was just a sort of simple process which enabled lots of different people within the brewery to take part in, um, in this workshop where we dyed uh, the timber. It was quite low skill, didn't take up a lot of their time or require them to kind of spend lots of time outside of hours doing something which was supposed to be fun, but ultimately was work. Um, and I think it was quite successful in, in creating something which felt um, like it had been maybe ambiguous in terms of the, the length of time that it had been on site. It has a kind of ready-made kind of pattern and character which is a bit looser than most um, kind of uh, manufactured buildings today. Uh, and the interior as well, it felt quite important to try to make a space which felt um, kind of homely and quite domestic, um, as well as, uh, well at the same time being, you know, quite a large scale structure. Um, and we did that through working with um, a man called Nakamoto-san, who uh, was a local hermit who built his own house um, over a long, long time. Um, and we visited his house and had lunch with him. And he, he cooked everything on this, what's called an irori, which is like a, an earth fireplace kind of set into the ground. So it's sort of half in the ground um, with this kind of lip up. Um, and you really make it by just gathering kind of stones and, and earth and straw, so kind of adobe mix um, from around the site that you then sort of stack up in, in this kind of simple ring shape um, and then quite carefully finish um, in, in a very sort of patient process actually. So using very crude materials like, you know, all the rocks really are irregular sizes and, um, and, and just like mud, basically a clay plaster that you make from materials that are gathered on site, you can create something which feels quite, um, actually quite refined and bakes as hard, um, almost as a, as a kind of compacted earth or concrete. Um, and that lightens over time and we ended up washing that 
all around the base of the interior, so it kind of bound the concrete foundation in, to place as well. Um, there are also a series of, kind of furniture elements that needed to go in this building, so you weren't necessarily sitting on the, the mud floor. Um, and we worked with another, this, um, this guy here, um, who made some quite often erotic uh, sculptures from bits of timber that he'd find in the forest. Um, they're often very suggestive, I haven't included any examples here. Um, but we worked with him to just take um, logs, essentially the, the base parts of the trees that would be cut down from the structure, um, which were, were too thick, essentially. They were kind of not necessary, they were excess from the, from the process. Um, and just use a simple set of tools that he would use to make sculptures, so hand axes um, and, and chisels to make um, some quite simple uh, some stools from a single piece of timber. Um, so we spent a day, it was quite a quick process um, uh, to sort of ref refine these down into sort of almost like mushroom shaped objects. And then because they're very rough, when you finish them without um, necessarily like mechanical tools, uh, we used a blowtorch just to, to burn off all of the, the kind of loose uh, fibres and things, which makes it then much easier to kind of sand and oil and finish and get quite a high level of um, kind of finish to the overall object. And that also kind of seals the timber um, and prevents um, some sort of splitting and, and also insects, it makes it a bit more waterproof and resilient. Um, so it was a kind of way of using a very simple process to increase the durability of the, um, the objects. There we go. Uh, yeah, so then we made sort of six of these in a day, it was quite quick. Um, process and then finally, um, because there was a, a kind of ritual around the, the kind of making or, or drinking in this space, whether it was tea or beer, um, we made also a series of ceramic uh, cups, which were made very simply from press molds. So you get balls of plaster, plaster, press them into um, a kind of void shape, usually a single piece. Um, and there's a, a kind of Central European, um, very low fire, low temperature firing technique um, that we wanted to use, which um, often involved a kind of brewing yeast in the mixture that you would use as a glaze. Um, so it's a bit like a raku firing technique, which you typically kind of fire in an open barbecue or something like that. Um, and you glaze things often to create, uh, to make them hygienic enough to be able to use for the kind of food and drink. Um, so in this case, we prepared a kind of yeasty mixture, like a batter, um, which is on the left, see here. And you heat uh, the, the, the pieces up to about uh, 1,000 degrees in this bucket. Then you take them out with the tongs, and you bring them over, and you dip them um, into this mixture, and it kind of sizzles um, and, and makes uh, like very unusual kind of patterns on the outside. As it cools very quickly, you dip it into the water to kind of set uh, the yeast, the yeast glaze, um, and then you leave them to dry for about an hour to, to kind of cool off. And what you get, quite quickly, <laughs> maybe I'll just go up there, um, is this very unusual sort of series of um, kind of markings and patterns on all the different vessels. So the vessels themselves are quite simple, they're actually just made from taking um, bottles. I think the, the tall, fatter one is a Coke bottle, um, the other two are San Pellegrino, like fizzy water bottles. Um, the smaller ones are just half pint glasses, um, the shape you get in England. So often again, like not being too, not kind of labouring too much over the shape of something, and I think we're interested in things which are formally quite simple, but materially quite rich and unusual and varied. Um, yeah, so this project was one where um, I guess there's quite a few elements, a very small, simple design project in a way, but each of the processes was, was quite rich. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit about um, our, our kind of largest project to date, um, which is for... <coughs> that's 30 minutes, okay. I'm going to go fast. Um, so got the Goldsmiths is uh, in um, New Cross in, in South London. Um, 
So when I point, okay. you're just doing manually. Okay. <laughs> this is it's a good bit of theatre. Yeah. Um, so it's an old Victorian bathhouse. So the kind of the public building would have been where you went to kind of wash and socialise. Um, there we go. Yeah, okay. Much better. Um, so you have these kind of extraordinary old bathing pools and, and wash facilities. Um, but behind those um, were the, the kind of boiler houses and the, the kind of industrial structures which would have heated all the water and things like that, which had been closed for 50 years while the front part had been kind of used as art studios and things like that. Um, and so the brief for this project within a kind of campus was to reuse the, the historic buildings, which you can see kind of, oh, sorry, I, I can talk about it this as well. Um, the kind of old baths here, but also to add in some new spaces for, for kind of contemporary art um, program. They have to be air conditioned and, and environmentally controlled and things like that. Um, but also to make use of the existing kind of industrial fabric. If we go to the next one. Um, and so for this project again, um, we tended to build very large-scale models. Um, this one is a 1 to 33 model of the whole... Um, oh, oh no. um, ..of the whole structure, again, because it was a public competition um, and there was a public vote on the scheme. We felt like the best way to explain the scheme would be through the construction of this, this kind of large-scale model, both to talk about the spatial ideas but at this sort of scale, you can also start to talk about the kind of material characteristics as well. Next slide. Um, and then we'll often combine that sort of scale of model making with larger, kind of um, very crude, actually, sort of shoebox models. Um, so this model would have taken about half a day to make. It's very, very simple, like four bits of foam board, um, but quite large. That means you can get very, very high quality photos. And actually, we find these much more intuitive as a, as a way of um, kind of developing designs and testing kind of conditions within spaces than maybe rendering um, and things like that. They, I think they're much more, it's a different way of thinking through kind of spatial questions we find. Um, next slide. But I think within this context we were also very interested um, in how we could uh, create a character for the new building um, which was a sort of hybrid of uh, a sort of civic and public structure um, but that was in dialogue with the the industrial building and the, the kind of history of this structure so it wasn't too kind of fussy as a new contemporary addition to what was an old working building um, and we did quite a lot of material tests for this um, varying from kind of uh, pressed metal and zinc um, and ended up developing um, these kind of material samples which took a very, very simple and cheap material, um, which is corrugated cement, uh, and did quite a few tests on different colours and finishes and different ways of uh, kind of oiling, using stains or acids to kind of give a different treatment. And then we'd leave those out in the yard for a few months um, to kind of see how they'd weather. So we were sort of interested in, in having quite a handmade kind of quality um, which is equivalent in some ways to the sorts of quality you can read in these industrial structures. I think there's a very different feeling um, or variety that you find in buildings of this period. Like even though you know, this structure was made using a repetitive process, each one of these panels has quite a different character and that's a result of the way that they were made, expressing very small variations. That's very different to the way that, say, a car is made, where a thousand of them are almost completely uniform. Um, and I think there's quite a, a different experience uh, when, you, when you sort of look at a structure like this to when you look at 50 cars in a parking lot. Like those subtle variations are possible to pick up on. Um, and so even within um, quite uniform structures, there's immense variety and difference. And it's subtle, but, um, but I think you can sort of read the process in a way which is very different and um, difficult also in most kind of modern structures where the materials are quite inscrutable. There are no marks of the process by which they're made, often. Um, and I think it gives a sort of... Uh, it makes them kind of, I think, like quite unemotive or difficult to, um, to kind of develop a, an emotional relationship to the world around you when those, you can't understand how those things were made or see the processes that went into making them. Um, 
And so we felt like it was quite important for this building to have a, a richer character and something which expressed a bit more variety. Um, but again, a bit like I said with these, um, with these tiles, there's an immense cost to doing things bespoke often. Um, and so we can draw out the system and we can make the kind of samples and, and make a prototype um, at, you know, at scale. But then we can take it to a builder and the builder will say, I've never done that before. It's going to cost four times the price that you think it will or whatever. Um, and I think often that's, that's partly to do with risk, um, you know, because a huge amount of, I think, uh, the building industry today is about managing and negotiating risk in the process, but also in the kind of warranties and things that go into building products. It's much more systematized than it has ever been much more industrialized and much more difficult to kind of make space for um, maybe your own authorship within. Um, but also because there's just an element of the unknown. And, and often in drawing something like this and working out how it would work, you know, we, by the time you've figured it out and you're having a, contract, a discussion with the contractor, you know, you know that it will work in a way that they will never believe you, you know, in a way. And... And so in this kind of project, we're very interested in maybe trying to take some of that responsibility back off the contractor, um, where it feels reasonable to do so and where we can trust our judgment. Um, next slide. Um, yeah, I mean, so we settled in the end on a kind of greenish color, but next slide. Um, and so we built a kind of large scale mock-up of the, the kind of most complex element, the corner joint where it turned, and also the capping detail. Um, and then after this, we built another one which was, was almost full scale of one facade. So as a way of testing the details, um, working out how much it would cost to do, um, and then we could ask the contractor to omit that from their bit of work, and that we would take on responsibility for, for making this, this cladding element <coughs> for the building. Um, so that was completed fairly recently, um, and worked very well, I think, as, a, as an example of um, you know, how in order to sort of guarantee a particular result or get a certain quality within the costs available for the project, I think um, it was necessary to sort of take out responsibility away from the builder and, and do that ourselves. Also, this is the kind of work actually, like it, it pays very well relative to architecture, um, which is interesting for us because I think if we want to retain our, our sort of autonomy or a sort of freedom to be a bit more selective about who we work for and try and do more public work than private work, then I think increasingly it's going to become very difficult to do that if we work only in the traditional way where the only source of income for a business is to be designing projects. Like the fees for projects are coming down and down and down and that's happening everywhere. Um, and I think that's only going to become more of a problem in the future. So as a company, we're interested in being able to do this kind of thing as an extension of our practice because it gives us more control, but it also makes us a bit more resilient um, kind of financially and as a, as a business, which I think is interesting to, to think about. Next slide. Um, yeah, so at the time I put this together, the, um, the building was just on, yeah, on site, so next slide. Um, but I guess in, we sort of started to work in this way um, Ten years ago, really, through our first project that we did after graduating from school. So when we were 22 um, in 2010. Um, next slide, please. Um, and that began with a project uh, which lasted for, for kind of eight weeks in the summer. Um, and it involved probably about 100 people contributing to the construction of it over the, the time frame. Um, as I said at the beginning, the, the kind of conditions in London at this time were that many, many sites which were scheduled for big developments were put on hold um, because of financial crises and, and credit crunches. Um, and kind of consequently, lots of sites like this had a very uncertain future. And I think we were interested in... Um, next slide, please. Um, in trying to find a way of creating a simple narrative um, and taking responsibility for a site for a short period of time um, and thinking both about how to, to kind of reimagine that site in terms of its physical form, but also what kind of uses might be possible within it as a kind of new public project. Um, and so we produced this image, uh, very simple and kind of 
suggestive image of something happening behind a curtain enclosing um, uh, the kind of s the petrol station forecourt. Uh, next image, please. Um, and then set about making it. So we sent that out to a developer, negotiated use of the site for free, um, and raised about 7,000 euros, so a very, very small amount of money, um, and started gathering together kind of whatever materials we could, we could find for that budget. Um, so this silvery kind of fabric, which we turned into a curtain, um, is a material called Tyvek, uh, which is usually used underneath uh, kind of roofing tiles. It's a, it's a membrane, basically. Um, this had been misprinted or had a few tears in the roll or whatever, so it couldn't be sold for use in industry, so we were able to get that. Um, and then once we had the kind of materials to hand, we developed processes which made use of them and gave them a kind of different quality. Um, in this case, using one domestic sewing machine, which is about this big, um, and sort of passing it through, I mean, it was like kilometres of stitching, kind of going through this machine to create these curtains. Um, and again, very, very few drawings for this building. Like, really, the image that we had at the beginning was kind of held <coughs> as a kind of common idea, but all of the details really were worked out through, through prototyping um, and testing. Yep. Um, and that kind of extended to all aspects of the project, so making kind of quite fine <coughs> furniture uh, for the inside from old um, kind of primary school waste furniture, basically. Um, we built a vacuum former, which is like a heat forming machine um, using a domestic hoover and some heat guns. That didn't work very well, actually, to be fair. Um, but more successful was a very simple uh, design for a, for a flip up chair. So reducing the kind of cinema to a very simple set of elements, a sign, these flip up chairs and the curtain. Um, and they were just made from two eight foot scaffold boards each with zero waste. Um, so again, very economical, but also a process which was simple enough for people that had very little experience of making to kind of come onto site. If you were there for an hour, you could leave having made a chair, having never made anything before. That was a kind of realistic expectation given the level of complexity in the design of those objects. So next slide, please. Um, and so this was the interior. So it kind of made use of the, the qualities of the structure that were already there. Um, created this kind of extraordinary and unusual sort of felt-like interior um, from the curtain, um, and then a hundred wooden chairs, and a smattering, like, there's like ten velvet red chairs that we borrowed from a cinema museum in there. So as you came in the front, you know, whilst you're likely to sit on an uncomfortable one, you could see a comfortable one, and it just sort of, you know, made you feel a whole lot better about the experience that you're about to go through. But it, I think, again, just trying to be quite economical often, um, I think particularly as budgets on architecture projects decrease, we're interested really in often trying to be very economical and resourceful with, with most of what we do, but then really concentrate the investment into a, a few moments in a project which really elevate it. Um, next slide, please. Uh, and then we programmed a load of films. Um, there's a main road right behind the screen, so often um, they were films with very little dialogue or subtitles or... Um, those kinds of things, things which didn't rely on kind of tense, subtle moments um, where somebody was, you know, saying to somebody else that they loved them just as an ambulance went past or something like that. They're more kind of cop chases and things like that. Uh, next slide. Um, and then at the end, we'd all go down a ladder at the back and kind of whip up the curtain. Um, and it sort of reversed who was the audience, maybe, and, and, and who was the sort of spectacle on the street. So a very, very crude project in some ways, very, very low budget Everything in it really was quite laborious and handmade. Um, but I think that, that sort of established an idea that we might be able to work in a way um, as architects, which was quite different from the experience that we were having in practice, having recently graduated, which was predominantly spending our time designing things uh, digitally and through um, sort of working through projects in quite a, an abstract and removed way from the construction site and from the sites where materials... Um, are kind of made and, and kind of industry produces much of the, the kind of hardware um, and stuff that kind of makes up the city. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, the, and that was the sign again was just a white painted MDF, very simple, with some, neo, um, some lights that we took out of the shop and used to uplight it. So it was quite, yeah, just very um, kind of making do with what we were able to, to kind of get our hands on, really. Um, next. Next slide. 
Um, well, 70 slides to go, I'm going to rattle through. So, um, so Sugar House Studios is where we work, um, and we, we're now in a different studio space to the one that we were, we kind of began our, our careers in. Um, but this was the first project, so it was quite formative for us as a space where we were able to take some of these ideas about making and production uh, and, um, and kind of build more of a kind of culture and a community around that sort of uh, access to those kinds of facilities. Next slide, please. Um, so this was the context. It was on the canal side in London, um, but it was changing a lot. Next slide, please. Um, and next slide. Um, so within a kind of area near the Olympic Park in East London, which was being massively transformed by redevelopment. Um, lots and lots of housing being built in the area. And uh, next slide, please. Lots of the industry which had historically kind of populated um, this part of London was being removed. Um, and, and with that, lots of space that is available to businesses who make things. Um, historically, that might be bricks, you know, uh, steel working, light industry and manufacture, candle making, paint making, incredible kind of diversity of stuff that used to happen in sites like this. Um, next slide, please. Um, and so over time, we sort of occupied uh, two very simple sheds um, and, and kind of sought to create um, a space in which quite a wide variety of different people that make things could come together uh, that we could work with in our practice to build buildings and larger scale projects. Um, but also that just brought together a sort of ecology of different uses um, and, and processes on one site in a way that's much more informal maybe than other um, types of, of kind of creative workspace. Next slide, please. Um, so within there, we had our, our architecture practice, um, people that did metalworking, woodworking, all kinds of textile production, and also 3D manufacture and things like that. Uh, next slide, please. Um, but also try to build a link with local industry. Um, so this is a, a kind of nondescript uh, shed um, where an organisation called the Building Crafts College uh, teach from. Uh, and they're one of the UK's kind of premier or like last remaining really traditional crafts colleges um, teaching stoneworking and woodworking and things like that. Next slide, please. Um, so they have these extraordinary facilities in here. But once you finish graduating, and you go out in the world, you don't have access to any of the resources which enabled you to work uh, in this way. So it's very difficult to graduate as a 25-year-old joiner and then think about how to set up a joinery business. You have to go and work for a big company that makes beds or cabinets or whatever. Um, next slide, please. Similarly, with stoneworking, um, they have this incredible uh, kind of you know, talent line of people being trained. Um, extraordinarily skillful people, but there's nowhere to sort of step into afterwards. Next slide, please. Um, and so we were quite interested in sort of trying to make some extra capacity on this site that we had, a lease on for a few years, um, to, to kind of be able to provide and kind of co-locate um, more people that were interested in, in kind of making as a profession. Um, and so we designed and built a very, very simple structure. Um, so we, this was the largest, at the time, the largest scale structure that we built ourselves. Um, we now have a construction company which builds <coughs> structures of this sort of scale of, and complexity, so re relatively small. Um, but the idea, we only had three, um, three months, uh, sorry, three years on this site before we would have to move. So the building had to be able to be built and then come down again and, and move in a relatively short time frame. Um, so we designed it to be a timber structure. Next slide, please. With all of the connections um, and kind of joints just screwed or bolted. Um, so it could be assembled very quickly, dismantled very easily, and a very, very simple kind of uh, open barn with this large shared space um, in the middle. And again, very, very economical. This was built for uh, 100,000 pounds, so about 110,000 euros. Um, in about six weeks, so pretty fast. The, just one kind of prefabricated cladding panel on the outside. Um, and in some ways, a very crude, next slide, please. Crude, simple building that we then just let <coughs> tenants move in and, and um, inhabit themselves. We didn't really need to, to sort of set out how they would make use of the space or whether they wanted to separate the spaces between them or those negotiations. So it was, again, very loose. Next slide, please. 
Um, but within this context um, of, of lots of industrial spaces being demolished, I think often because the processes that exist within them aren't really valued or visible, you know, they're perceived to happen in low value spaces and as a consequence are, are themselves seen to be of relatively low value or importance. Um, we were interested in how we could make this very simple structure be something more and, and that, that kind of celebrated rather than kind of concealed um, the kinds of life that happens within it. So we worked with one of the artists who was moving into the space to develop um, a relatively simple um, kind of concrete tile. Um, I've got one of them here. You can come and touch it at the end. Um, but it, they're, they're pretty lightweight. So they're, they're made using... Um, uh, fiberglass shards uh, and then pigmented concrete and as you can see in a very simple mold um, with then just like one nub which sits on top of a timber batten and then you just get a screw and poke through twice so two fixing holes through into the batten um, and then the next one will come down and conceal that so a very very simple um, kind of process where we just made this metal tool by bending it round a former in the workshop, again, like incredibly crude and simple. Um, and then Molly worked probably every day for two weeks, making about 100 a day, producing 2,000 tiles, and just making decisions as she went along, really, on one day she'd make yellow ones, and one day she'd make green ones. And again, there's no real overall idea of the kind of the pattern or the, the way in which these things should be arranged. Next slide, please. Um, and then the contractors really just had three boxes at the bottom and they were taking them out and putting them on the building. Um, and so it create, that variety kind of comes through both a looseness in the process um, and a, a kind of not trying to exercise too much control over how they're then attached to the building. So we've designed the simple unit, um, which in itself contains a set of rules about how it has to be applied. You can't really apply it or fix it incorrectly um, but the overall formal organisation isn't something that we feel ne like very precious. If we've designed the thing well, then actually there can be a lot of freedom um, in terms of how they're organised. Next slide, please. Um, and this was the, the final um, facade. So the idea was to create something which reflected and celebrated the industrial uses within the building, but that also transformed the character of the yard itself into something that was more public and more civic. Um, than just this kind of industrial working yard where lots of messy things would happen. Next slide, please. Um, it became a bit of a strange uh, like pilgrimage site for people um, who love posting unusual things on Instagram. Lots of fashion shoots. Next slide, please. But more importantly, it was, was actually very successful as a kind of, um, as a sort of strange public industrial hybrid, I think, which uh, hosted all kinds of different civic uses. Um, next slide, please. So I'm going to talk very quickly um, about our kind of longest ongoing project in Granby in Liverpool. We've been working for sort of six years, um, next slide please, in an area which has had a very um, difficult history. Uh, there has been extensive demolitions in the area over the last 30 years and um, the, it's been very contentious, lots of battling between uh, the residents in the area and the uh, local authorities in the city. Next slide, please. Um, historically, it was an extraordinarily diverse neighbourhood. Liverpool was a port city, um, and so had, you know, really since the 1900s, uh, a very large kind of di and diverse immigrant community. Next um, slide, please. But that was really broken apart in the 1980s um, after a series of, of riots, which really reshaped the kind of political landscape in, in that part of Liverpool. Um, and so after that series of riots, next slide, please. Um, there was a program to relocate large parts of the population to other bits of the city. So if you were renting off the council, uh, if you were in social housing, you were moved. Um, so only a very small number of people that owned their homes were able to stay in this area. Next slide, please. And this was the condition um, that it was generally reduced to between 1980 and 2010. Um, so of 14 streets, four were left. Um, but only 50 residents in a neighbourhood that had historically had, you know, 800 or 1,000. Um, and there was, a, you know, a, a lot of mistrust between, you know, the, the reason a, a building will be missing a roof is because the, the council will have come with a digger and hit the roof in, you know, to, ac to accelerate the process of decay inside. 
Um, you can see lots of kind of boarded up windows and things like that. Next slide, please. Um, and so within this context, lots of the residents that were still there, or the sort of 50 or so residents that were there, became increasingly organized and were very resistant to the idea that they would move somewhere else uh, in exchange for the houses being bought um, and or, or the area being demolished and rebuilt at a lower density, so more suburban. They were very insistent that this density, this kind of urban neighborhood uh, quality was really integral to the way that they wanted to live in the city. Um, and so they started to extend very domestic actions like painting and cleaning and planting out into the streets. Um, next, And also running kind of markets and things to sort of challenge this idea that the city or this area of the city had no kind of um, future to challenge what was said in the newspapers. Um, and also sort of planting the streets and things like that. So really introducing throughout this neighbourhood an incredibly informal <coughs> and kind of handmade character through just lots of, lots of small scale actions rather than one big kind of strategic move. Next slide, please. Um, and we helped them really develop a kind of plan, a strategy for the area um, that wasn't about having a big vision or a big idea. Um, it wasn't a master plan. It just looked at lots of small scales of action um, that they'd already kind of initiated and thought about how to extend those and build new infrastructure that could take that to a different scale. Um, next slide, please. And so that primarily looked at the housing and the public space and also the commercial life of the area. So to build on their sort of DIY um, kind of guerrilla tactics to start to think about a more strategic um, renewal of the area that they were in control of. Next slide, please. Um, it began with 10 houses, and this was kind of the typical condition that the houses were in, um, and they had to be refurbished very, very cheaply. Well, there wasn't a lot of, uh, of budget. We had about 70,000 euros per house. Next slide, please. Um, and so that was necessarily very simple in lots of ways. Just if a, if a roof had fallen in, we would rebuild it, but you wouldn't build, build the attic back in. You know, every decision was made spatially on a cost basis, but that also created a real variety in the you know, within these uniform terraces. Each one actually was slightly different in terms of its internal spatial arrangement. Next slide, please. But the, the interior fit-outs themselves were, were quite basic, actually. Like the, we had to keep the details simple so the builders could make them in the way that they knew how. But within that, next slide, please. Next slide. Um, there were a set of elements which we tried to um, take kind of simple objects in the house and find ways of reusing them or giving them a different kind of quality um, or characteristic. Um, so in this case, uh, like the standard tile that you can get for about 10 cents um, and getting coloured decals, which are a kind of transfer that you cut out, uh, just paint water onto the tile and it will stick and then you refire it and it, and it holds. So we could change 100 tiles in about an hour uh, using that method, put them in the kiln. And that just changes in a very simple way, a bathroom which actually is as cheap as you can make it in many respects into something which feels like quite unique and, and, and different from house to house. Next thing, please. But perhaps the most kind of, um, the major elements within this process was the mantelpieces. Um, so historically, as you know, the historic interiors and grand houses in Madrid, you know, I'm, I'm sure are very similar. You have amazing plaster details around the cornices, the ceiling roses, the door handles, the, you know, all of the timber work. They're incredibly crafted spaces. I mean, this building, you can read the care that went into it in the details and the, the way that it's made. Everything you kind of touch, which is original, has such a different quality <coughs> to the kinds of things that they're typically replaced with today. Um, and after 20 years of these residents trying to get this project, you know, beyond things happening out in the street in an incremental way, it was really important that we didn't just build them a set of very cheap houses that were absolute, you know, lowest common denominator. Um, and so these kinds of elements really were the way of trying to elevate and demonstrate care in the production of, of the domestic spaces. Um, the mantelpieces were symbolic because they were at the heart of the, the main living space in the house. Next slide, please. Um, next slide, please. Uh, next slide. These are just some of the interiors off they've been lived in for a bit, but next slide. Next slide. Next slide. Um, and so we, we sort of started by producing... Next slide. Um, by kind of working in one of the terraced houses 
um, where we were doing design for the houses in the back and running it as a site office, but also in the backyard using that as a mini factory to kind of manufacture lots of different products for the, home, for the homes and also having meetings with the contractor in the front room. So this quite informal kind of breaking down of the usual relationship between architect, contractor, client into something much more social, actually, and much more informal, which meant that we were able to approach the whole process in a, in a slightly more fluid way. Um, next slide, please. Um, and so we really tried to be quite resourceful and opportunistic. There wasn't a big budget for materials. So we kind of gathered things that the builders were stripping out of the empty houses, bits of broken brick or slate from the roofs or things from the rubble in the street, um, and kind of rebound those together using a concrete mix um, to kind of make um, these kind of mantel pieces. So they're quite like hefty, weighty things. And we produced lots of samples at this scale. Um, and these things which were intended to be quite expressive um, kind of elements. Next slide, please. Um, and gradually just kind of turned one of the shells of the houses into a, a kind of informal space of production. Next slide, please. Um, and it was at this time that we were sort of nominated for this, an art award in the UK called the Turner Prize. Um, and the opportunity then uh, kind of arose really to, to sort of think about how to take this and, and make not just the kind of products for 10 houses, but to think about uh, a manufacturing business in the local area that could play a role in future development of the area as well. Um, and so next slide, please. Um, we pulled together a kind of team of people from around Liverpool, some of whom were very skilled, some of whom kind of weren't very skilled at all. Uh, so it was quite a chaotic process. Next slide, please. Um, but really prototyping lots of different approaches to material production. Um, so ceramic products, timber products, um, fabric products and screen printing. So a huge array. Really the process was about getting as many people that had a connection to the area involved in the generation of products for this workshop. Um, and again, similar to, to maybe all of the objects I've described today, the idea was that they should be formally simple, rules-based, so that in making them there was kind of you know, richness and they were an educational process in the production of them, rather than us being really, really controlled about what exactly how something should look or feel or what colour it should be. So they're quite loosely defined, but a simple kind of formal framework. Um, next slide, please. And the outcome of that, after sort of eight weeks of production, was this immense variety of objects, from the kind of mantelpieces um, through to kind of plaster ceiling roses, which were made like you'd ice a cake, but using plaster, so you just kind of squirt it out. Um, these terracotta lampshades, which are very simple, just like a plaster bowl that you press different colours of terracotta shreds into. So all of these are actually very, very simple processes, but create quite, um, quite unusual objects that are very kind of material and each one different. Um, next slide, please. Uh, and so this was the, the kind of final range. So again, like stools, um, got a few of these um, kind of ceramic handles, which are, are quite unusual. Um, Again, very, very simple process. You just make a two-part mould, put some clay and clamp them together. Um, and then we had a barbecue in the back, and every day we'd light the barbecue. If you put coffee grounds or banana skins or whatever in there, um, it fires, you know, the, the, the kind of decomposition of those materials with heat creates a slightly different patination on the, um, on the handle. So they, they develop this kind of cloudy... Um, quite, kind of cosmic quality. It's quite, <laughs> quite good. It's very varied, um, as you can see here. Um, and then some of the things are very simple, like taking pre-existing objects and just marbling them. Um, yeah, and next slide, please. Um, but so over time, it's actually very difficult, especially within a small space, to manufacture lots of different things using different processes. So over time, we've kind of consolidated to making mainly ceramic items um, and, and to develop more of a specialism in that area. Next slide, please. Um, so thinking also about making domestic products, but also commercial products. So there's a bigger market for the kind of specification and for architects to, to kind of use these in other projects. Um, and so the idea is to try and build a business which provides <coughs> local jobs and opportunities for kind of skills and education, um, which is held in community ownership um, and which over time 
uh, can play a role or, or kind of build up its own capacity to be able to um, play a role in the ongoing renewal of the area, really. I guess the idea being that the renewal began through a series of very small scale and domestic actions. Um, it was quite DIY, it's like do it yourself. Um, and the, the, the kind of ethos of the workshop is to try to formalize and help scale up that ethos rather than be a business which is totally disconnected from the process of, of kind of bigger change. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, again, just a very simple technique, quite similar to the previous tile um, technique I showed. Yeah, next one. Um, and then also thinking about the role of manufacturing and, and industrial production in it. Uh, next slide, please. So I think often when you introduce kind of materials w uh, or machinery into the process, there's this huge advantage in that your costs drop through the floor. You can produce many things to a much higher quality much more quickly. But at the same time, you also reduce a skilled ceramicist to pressing a button or kind of loading, um, you know, just loading the machine. And that's very unrewarding work, particularly in a small business where you might be asking somebody to, to do this for like two or three years, potentially. Um, so again, we're kind of interested in, in how you can use tools in a way which enables like, better volume and quality of production, but doesn't just reduce the human to somebody who operates the machine. Um, and that's slightly different, and it's not you know, that simple to do, but I think we're quite interested in the kind of arts and crafts tradition and ideas of people like William Morris and, and John Ruskin. Um, in that respect and trying to sort of create a better balance between industrialization and production and, and the cost that that enables you to work at um, and also like think about the fulfilling conditions uh, in which people are working. So in this case it's, it's the, the ceramics business is increasingly interested in like the material innovation of the clay body itself um, rather than creating kind of exotic or, or particularly interesting formal objects um, and so the clay is kind of something that is constantly being developed. In this case, a kind of marbly clay, um, different mixtures and compositions will create a different outcome in the product. So it's, that's the sort of the preparation of the clay bodies is actually where the skill is in some senses. Next slide, please. Um, and then that produces this kind of immense variety of different, different objects. Next slide, please. Um, you know, some cups, plates, mainly sort of homewares. A nice example of here. Um, Next slide, please. Yeah, and so, it, again, thinking about how we kind of use tools to be able to scale, um, but not just create sort of monotonous or things which all have a similar and repetitive character. Um, next slide, please. Uh, next slide as well. Um, and so this is kind of an ongoing process. The workshop is involved in lots of different projects we produced. Um, Another range of objects um, fairly recently, which are these, which are a kind of reinterpretation of a traditional Victorian encaustic tile. Um, so much harder wearing for kind of floor use that we installed um, in a pavilion in Venice that was then, the floor was then moved to a permanent installation as part of a public project in that city. Um, and for the, for the workshop, it's a kind of constant ongoing process of development of new products, and that's necessary just to, for it to remain viable. Um, but I think we're also interested in, in other kinds of infrastructure within this, this neighbourhood that might enable uh, a kind of wider community of people to be involved in production. Um, this is uh, a sketch or drawing um, for the reuse of the corner sites on the high street. Um, next, please. Um, where, one of the, where some of the buildings are in worse condition, they can't possibly be reused as housing because it would cost too much money. And so within this context, next slide, please. Um, we've recently completed the project to turn this into something like a public garden. So sort of take the informal character of the planting and, and sort of street planting that um, has developed over a long time and kind of scale that up in the sense through this kind of public greenhouse, which will also have a, a kind of public maker space and, and, and production space in there. So it kind of doubles up as a meeting room and somewhere to kind of hopefully continue to support through artist residencies um, the kind of DIY spirit and, and kind of culture of making, which has really been very important as a part of the renewal and, and, and change that's happening in the area. Um, that's the end. And I 
have gone on well past the amount of time I was allocated. So, so thank you very much for your patience for this time. Well, well, thank you. Thank you very much for this great lecture, this amazing lecture, where you have showed us the experimental approach to materi materiality and how this process makes all these pieces like unique and this character of uniqueness is also in the in the spaces it qualifies as well i would like also now to maybe to open a moment for for discussion for for some questions from the audience and if there is any questions Um, in your project, there are of, there's often um, an element of coincidence. Did you ever come to a point where you regret to uh, give up control? Um, I think it's always... So, both as an idea in terms of, I think material production, but also in terms of more like strategies and thinking about urban space. And we're kind of interested in, uh, I think in, in all of our work, about how much to define, like how much you need to define to ensure, um, you know, to, to create a direction maybe, or to, to ensure that you're not taking complete, uh, and like unreasonable risk, particularly in public projects or projects where you're working quite directly with a group of people that are quite exposed to your actions, maybe. Um, but at the same time, not trying to anticipate all the potential things that might be possible, because that's very limited, right? Like, and I think one of the, the things, one of the characteristics of like a lot of contemporary urban space is that they are very rigid. Um, you know, we build now uh, in very kind of very large projects, very very quickly, which is very different to the historic mode of development of the city, I guess. And so naturally, you know, places which have grown more organically had a looser structure and were constantly more contested, you know, and 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 subject to many more coincidences, if you want to put it like that. They're, they're just there's more space for opportunities within that, the process by which those cities, bits of city were made. So they're a bit more unpredictable. Um, I think increasingly, you know, like with, at the building scale, um, the processes by which buildings are made are much more systematized, much more closed processes, you know, much more of it is about assembling a set of components rather than being able to design from first principles. Um, and both of those things, at this, either the scale of the city or the building, or, or if you take it back down to a product, you know, um, I think make very kind of boring and predictable situations. Right? And uh, there's a sort of sameness, which is the product. That even if a building is formally different, it's almost, you, it, it subscribes to exactly the same kind of logical or kind of process, maybe like the, the you can sort of see the similarity in the way that it's assembled, um, and uh, so I think we're we're quite interested in in taking as many risks as we can within a process, but making sure that there's enough structure in there that we'll get uh, that you know that the process is open to surprise um, and the unexpected. Um, and, and isn't predetermined very early through the production of like a highly specific visual or something. Like even this is it's quite ambiguous about what it is really. It's a very simple image. Um, it's, it's actually like doesn't tell you a huge amount of information. I think that's also why when I mentioned earlier we talk about we use models a lot because I think they feel like they're always more open and adjustable than you know uh, a kind of a render or something like that which is a more of a um, fixed description of something. So, yeah, there aren't actually any situations I can think of where they've gone disastrously wrong because we didn't set up enough of a framework. Um, 
I, I can think of more situations where we've produced something um, where we tried to anticipate how, the, you know, the role it might play in a public space or something, where, we, where we're actually we've, we've had too much control, which has been based on too many assumptions that we build, and then we're like, uh, actually, like, the client didn't have as much information or as good an understanding of the context that they thought they were working in to brief us properly, and actually that it's often a problem that projects are too rigid or too too well defined and aren't able to, to be adjustable or adaptable, um, especially or in program, than that we just haven't set up enough of a framework that everything just turns into a kind of, you know, complete anarchic mess. Um, so actually, I think often it's too much order rather than uh, too much disorder. Um, but I think that's quite a, quite a conscious thing. And I think we're quite interested in... Um, yeah, like, like not trying to work in a way which takes all risk out of the process um, because I think the possibilities then actually become very limited quite quickly. You just, that is what my experience of architecture was predominantly, was about managing expectations and risk and trying to preclude failure. But by precluding failure, you always end up with a, a relatively anodyne result, I think, actually, in some situations. Um, Long-winded answer. To <laughs> covered a few things, maybe. But Is there any other question? Hi. Um, in your projects, you usually let the people who are going to use the building to help in the process of making it. Do you think that doing that helps you release the pressure of having it completely um, prepared, like beforehand? Um, it's a good question. So I think, yeah, we're often assumed to be like participatory architects or and we're not really um, and I think there certainly isn't a situation in which we like are we, we are the only people responsible for design in a design process so nobody else should be making those decisions um, and and that's our responsibility and we shouldn't give it away because that would I think that would be irresponsible but that doesn't mean that... So what we try to do is share uh, as much as possible the agenda for the project. Um, and so that the people, in, like, the people that we're working with have real agency to make decisions about the project, but not to design the project themselves. Um, and there's quite a big difference there, I think. And, and I think it's a real problem with... Uh, I'm very critical of, like modes of architectural practice which like give away the pen you know and and pretend that design isn't a, like a highly sophisticated learned skill because um it, it is that's why it takes a long time to study it um and the problems are about like who has power in the conversation about determining how spaces are made not about who is you know it's, it's like in in terms of shaping and ownership of the agenda rather than the process of the, the, like um, actually being able to make design decisions. I think that's quite a common misunderstanding. But in processes where we've involved other people in the production, I guess it's, it's useful as a way of enabling people to understand things in a different way. So I think I find mo like models are much better tools for talking about design because everybody can understand. Every people grew up with dolls' houses or they live in the world and look at space all the time. And, and so models are a scaled-down version of the way in which people process space. Um, that's very different to a drawing, which is totally unintuitive to most people that aren't professional. Um, and so if you're interested in creating a kind of level platform to have a discussion about a project, then you have to find a way of, of speaking in a language which people understand. So that's important. Um, but in terms of involvement in the production of projects, 
people were involved in those kind of early ones, like the cinema I showed and the, the thing under the motorway right at the beginning. Um, but I think often we found also that when you're setting up processes, it's very easy to, it's, very, it's quite a difficult thing to do to not design a production line because that's the way in which you produce things quickly. You know, you actually need a lot of time and space and, and capacity to, you know, the focus of the project in its entirety almost has to be not on the outcome. So if you're only interested in the educational potential of a project, then you, that has to be like the only thing that you can't allow to fail. You have to be prepared for like the, the, the thing not to get built. You can't have something which is both entirely about a collective process and about getting an outcome. Because at some point in there, like those two things aren't always compatible. And you have to be like in a, in a school scenario, you have to be able to enable somebody to fail and learn from their mistakes. Um, in the same way that within a truly collective process, you have to enable them to, to have arguments and have differences of opinion that might not be reconcilable. Um, and so in situations like when somebody's asking us to build or design houses or help them think about a concrete problem where actually we can't allow it to fail, we have to be quite careful about how we structure the extent to which that is a, understood as a collective process. Um, and it's more about making sure that the person who's making the decision, um, I think in lots of projects, is not your typical client. Um, so often, you know, trying to give away some of the power that we hold to make decisions to other people that we've spent quite a lot of time trying to inform or trying not to think of the client as like the local authority just because they're the people that hold the budget but to think about it as the people that are going to use the space ultimately and to make sure that the process is a dialogue with them, you know. Um, yeah, so it's, it's not, um, it's, a bit, it's a bit different, yeah, I think, depending on what the, the intention is. And, and something like the Liverpool Project, there's a very different idea of how we ought to work with a wide community of people than in other projects, which were primarily about the process, you know, like it didn't really matter if the cinema got made. Like, when it got made, we were like, wow, it got made. Um, you know, it was, it was entirely about trying to make something um, in those first instances. And th that it happened was, yeah, almost like it, an entirely separate project, actually, once it was built and it had a life. Um, it wasn't intended like that, but I think that's how, how it was. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, depends enormously on the project. Um, I mean, for the Liverpool project, we've been working there six years. So it's like, I mean, we've completed two more buildings just very recently, which I don't have photos of yet. But so it's often, I mean, we're like other architects, you know, like we work to a program and um, if we're not efficient, the money will run out and that's a problem. Uh, you know, but I also think we we try to take time or make time or, or to at the beginning to be clear that there is maybe value in in a project in, in a process which goes a bit more like this than than just is a linear like problem solving situation. Um, I think we try to talk a lot about. Um, you know, again, whether it's like making an object or designing a building or thinking about a strategy for an area, about, um, you know, like processes, not things, right? So we're not that interested in the outcome. You know, the outcome of a master, like thinking about a piece of city or a building as an outcome is a bit of a fiction anyway, because as soon as it's built, it's in use and that's a different life. Like these things are always, um, you know, are always kind of, constantly changing and in a way it's better to try to think of them as processes where we start by introducing something simple and the way then we're involved often for quite a long time after the thing is built making additions and changes and adaptations um, some projects we've set up a few organizations as well which is a totally different part of what we do really 
well, the workshop is one example, but there's there two or three other organisations we've set up. So a public workshop um, and an adventure playground in Glasgow, in Scotland, um, where we've had, we have quite a long-term involvement in those kinds of things. So five years after they've been finished, we're still on the board of trustees for those things. And we help them do, you know, when they need to grow or change something spatially, we help them do that. It's quite an informal relationship in an ongoing way with lots of projects, I think. Um, more, a bit more like a caretaker or something. Yeah, you know, like we, or like the Japanese carpenters traditionally, you'd like, if, you, if your carpenter built you a timber house, he'd come around every year, plane down the door so it slides easy again. You know, there's like a kind of ongoing relationship to the building after it's made, which is kind of how we try to to work in some situations, and that's kind of the way it is in Liverpool. It's like a, a kind of on, constant, ongoing relationship. No, it's it varies. Like in, I mean, in this project, we weren't the contractor. Um, one contractor did the houses, another one's done this project. But then we, we will often take bits out of the contracts and do them ourselves, where we think that's worthwhile. Uh, so the, the facade for, the, for this project, the, the gallery, um, for lots of different sort of smaller elements within some of the Liverpool projects. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it varies. And I think the way that we work is pretty varied. But maybe what is characteristic, not in every project, but the way that we try to work is in a way which is slightly more continuous and like in dialogue with people but that's also a reflection of the scale that we're working at right like we're not working at the moment on 20 million pound projects um but at the same time i think we're interested in in the building but also you know, lots of architects aren't that interested in, like, use, you know, and how buildings are used and the kind of cultural consequences, maybe, of the spaces once they're built. Whereas, because of the way that we started, uh, you know, with something like the cinema, we, we both programmed the space. You know, part of the life and what made that an interesting project is not just that we made a good space, it's that we also programmed it in a way which made it quite interesting and relevant to a, a quite a broad number of people. It was that we sold the tickets cheaply so that a variety of people could come. It wasn't like a commercial event. You know, all the, and so we're quite interested in like the calibration of all of those different things that go together to produce a particular like social or public quality to a thing, um, to a space or an environment, not just the building itself. And that enables you to then have a slightly different relationship to it, both before it's built as a thing and also in its use. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we don't like hang around things we finished just being like, what's happening? Don't, you know, yeah. But I think, um, I mean, in the case of the Liverpool project, somebody moved to Liverpool and now lives in Liverpool and runs the workshop. So in that case, no, like, an outcome of this project was that we set up a company that, we, that is locally based, that we run, and, and that's a long-term project. Um, and in the long term, we will, you know, we will make ourselves unnecessary when the people that we brought in as like, young adults are are able to run the business themselves and it will stay, it will continue to have a relationship with us, but we won't, one of us won't be like managing it and running it and making the decisions about it. Um, so, but there are, yeah, there are also situations where we just, we, we are hired just to design the building. Like sometimes that is the case, you know, like the Goldsmiths project, we were the architects, right? That was our, that was the extent of our role. We, we made a bit more out of that role by taking on responsibility for some aspects of the construction, but we don't have any ongoing role in the 
um, in the, the life of the organization as a whole, but we do in some of the projects that we're involved with, which is atypical, I guess. That's maybe why there's some ambiguity. Um, because when we set up a playground in Glasgow, it's like we both design the playgrounds and we design the organizational structure and the, like the teaching program of the playground in a way, you know, like what the, the set of social rules and governance of the organization are. And so we stay involved in that to be able to make sure that the organization continues to survive and is consistent with what it was set up to do and things like that. Um, yeah. Okay, anybody else? Well then, thank you very much, cool. James, for this great <laughs>